Short stories from the worlds of speculative fiction. The story this time is called Roller Ball Murder by William Harrison. It first appeared in Esquire magazine in 1973. It was reprinted in the book The Seventh Annual Best Science Fiction, 73, edited by Harry Harrison and Brian Aldiss. Roller Ball Murder by William Harrison. The game. The game. Here we go again. All glory to it. All things I am and own are because of Roller Ball Murder. Our team stands in a row, 20 of us in salute as the corporation hymn is played by the band. We view the hardwood oval track that offers us the rewards of mayhem. Fifty yards long, thirty yards across the ends, high banked, and at the top of the walls, the cannons which fire those frenzied twenty-pound balls, similar to bowling balls, made of ebonite, at velocities over three hundred miles an hour. Those balls careen around the track, eventually slowing and falling with diminishing centrifugal force, and as they go to ground or strike a player, another volley fires. Here we are, our team. Ten roller skaters, five motorbike riders, five runners or clubbers. As the hymn plays, we stand erect and tough. Eighty thousand sit watching in the stands. And another two billion viewers around the world inspect the set of our jaws on multivision. The runners, those bastards, slip into their heavy leather gloves and shoulder their lacrosse-like paddles with which they either catch the whizzing balls or bash the rest of us. The bikers, they ride high on the walls. Beware, mates, that's where the cannon shots are too hot to handle. And they swoop down to help the runners at opportune times. The skaters, those of us with the juice for it, protest. We clog the way, try to keep the runners from passing us and scoring points and become the fodder in the brawl. So two teams of us, 40 in all, go skating and running and biking around the track while the big balls are fired in the same direction as we move, always coming in from behind to scatter and maim us. And the object of the game, as if you didn't know, is for the runners to pass all the skaters on the opposing team, field a ball and pass it to a biker for one point. Bikers, by the way, may give the runners a lift, in which case those of us on skates have our hands full overturning 175cc motorbikes. There are no rest periods, no substitute players, and if you lose a man, your team plays short. Today, I turn my best side to the cameras. I am Jonathan E., none other, and nobody passes me on the track. I'm the core of the Houston team, And for the two hours of play, no rules, no penalties once that first cannon fires, I'll level any bastard runner who raises a paddle at me. We move. Immediately, there are pileups, bikes, skaters, referees, runners, all tangled and punching and scrambling, when one of the balls zooms around the corner and belts us. I pick up momentum and heave an opposing skater into the infield at center ring. Today, I'm brute speed. Driving, pushing up the track, dodging a ball, hurtling downward beyond those runners. Two runners do hand-to-hand combat, and one gets his helmet knocked off in a blow that tears away half his face. The victor stands there too long, admiring his work, and gets wiped out by a biker who swoops down and flattens him. The crowd screams, and I know the cameramen have it on isolated shots, and that viewers in Melbourne, Berlin, Rio, and L.A. are all heaving with excitement in their easy chairs. 
When an hour is gone, I'm still wheeling along, although we have four team members out with broken parts. One rookie may be dead, two bikes demolished. But the other team, good old London, is worse off. One of their motorbikes roars out of control, takes a hit from one of the balls, and bursts into flames. Wild cheering. And cruising up next to their famous Jackie McGee, I time my punch just right. He turns in my direction, exposes the ugly snarl inside his helmet, and I take him out of action. In that tiniest instant, I feel his teeth and bone give way, and the crowd screams approval. We have him now, we really do. And the score ends seven to two. Years pass, rules alter, and I hear of games in Manila now or in Barcelona with no time limits. Men bashing each other until there are no runners left, no way of scoring points. Uh, that's the coming thing. I hear of roller ball murder played with mixed teams, men and women wearing tearaway jerseys. Everything will happen. They'll change the rules till we skate on a slick of blood. We all know that. You see, before this century began, before the great Asian war of the 1990s, before the corporations replaced nationalism and the corporate police forces supplanted the world's armies, in the last days of American football and the World Cup in Europe, I was a tough young rookie who knew all the rewards of this game. Women. I had them all, even Betty a good marriage once. I had so much money after my first trophies that I could buy houses and land and lakes beyond the huge cities where only the executive class was allowed. My photo, then as now, was on the covers of magazines so that my name and the name of the sport were one. And I was Jonathan E., no other, a survivor, and much more in the bloodiest sport. At the beginning, I played for oil conglomerates, and then those corporations became known as energy I've always played for the team here in Houston. They've given me everything. How are you feeling? Mr. Bartholomew asks me. He's the head of energy, one of the most powerful men in the world. And he talks to me like I'm his son. I answer, <laughs> feeling mean. He tells me they want to do a special on Multivision about my career. Lots of shots on the side screen showing my greatest plays and the story of my life. How energy takes in orphans, gives them work and protection, makes careers possible and all that. Really feel mean, huh? Mr. Bartholomew asks again, and I answer the same, not telling him all that's inside me because, well, he'd probably misunderstand. Not telling him that I'm tired of the long season, that I'm lonely, and miss my wife, that I yearn for high, lost, important thoughts, and that maybe, just maybe, I've got a deep rupture in the soul. An old buddy, Jim Cletus, comes by the ranch for the weekend. Mackie, my present girl, takes our dinners out of the freezer and turns the rays on them. Cletus works as a judge now, and every game there are two referees, clowns, whose job it is to see nothing's amiss, and the judge who records the points scored. Cletus is also on the International Rules Committee, and he tells me they are considering some changes. A uh, penalty for being lapped by your own team, for one thing. It's a damn simple penalty, too, John. They'll take off your helmet. Cletus, once a runner for Toronto, fills up my oversized furniture and rests his hands on his bad knees. And I ask him, what else? Can you tell me, Cleet? Oh, just financial things. More bonuses for superior attacks, you know, bigger bonuses for being named World All-Star. And that'll be good news for you again. And there's some talk of reducing the two-month off-season. The viewers want more. After dinner, Cletus walks around the ranch with me and he asks if there's anything I want. Yeah, something, but I don't know what. Yeah, something's on your mind, John. We trudge up the path of a hillside. The Texas countryside stretches before us, pavilions of clouds. Did you ever think about death in your playing days? Yeah, well, never in the game itself. Off the track, I never thought about anything else. And we pause and take a good long look at the horizon. Uh, Jonathan, there's another thing in the rules committee. Uh, they're considering dropping the time limit. At least, God help us, John, the suggestions come up officially. Uh, naturally, I'm holding out for the time limit. Uh, I've played, you know, I know a man's limits. Uh, sometimes in that committee, Johnny, I feel pretty clumsy sitting there and insisting there should still be a few rules. The statistical nuances of roller ball murder entertain the multitudes as much as any other aspect of the game. The highest number of points scored in a single contest, 81. 
The highest velocity of a ball when actually caught by a runner, 176 miles per hour. Highest number of players put out of action in a single game by single skater, 13, world's record by yours truly. Most deaths in a single contest, 9, Rome against Chicago, December 4th of 2012. The giant lighted boards that circle above the track monitor our pace, record each fact of the slaughter, and we have millions of fans, it's always seemed strange to me, who never look directly at the action, but just study those statistics. A multivision survey established this. The most powerful men in the world are the executives. They run the major corporations that fix prices, wages, and the general economy. And we all know they're crooked, but they have almost unlimited power and money. But I have considerable power and money myself, and I'm still anxious. What can I possibly want, I ask myself, except possibly more knowledge? I consider recent history, which is virtually all anyone remembers, and how the corporate wars ended so that we settled into the six majors, energy, transport, food, housing, services, and luxury. Sometimes I forget who runs what. For example, now that the universities are operated by the majors and provide the farm system for rollerball murder, which major runs the universities, services, or luxury? And music is one of our biggest industries, but I can't remember who administers it. Narcotic research is now under food, and I remember it used to be under luxury. Anyway, I think I'll ask Mr. Bartholomew about knowledge. See, he's a man with a big view of the world, with values, with memory. My team flings itself into the void while his team harnesses the sun, taps the sea, finds new alloys, and is clearly just a hell of a lot more serious. The Mexico City game has a new wrinkle. They've changed the shape of the ball on us. Now, Cletus didn't even warn me. Maybe he couldn't. But here we are playing with a ball not quite round. Its center of gravity is altered, so it rumbles around the track in irregular patterns. This particular game's bad enough because the bikers down here are, well, they're getting wise to me. For years, since my reputation was established, bikers have always tried to get me out of a game early. But early in the game, I'm wary and strong, and I'll always gladly take on a biker, even since they put shields on the bike so we can't grab the handlebars. Now, though, those guys know I'm getting older. Still mean, but slowing down, as the sports pages put it. So they let me bash it out with the skaters and runners for as long as possible before sending the bikers after me. Knock out Jonathan E., they say, and you've beaten Houston. And that's right enough, but they haven't done it yet. Mackie is gone, and in her place now is the new one, Daphne. My Daphne's tall and English and likes photos, always wants to pose for me. And sometimes we get out our boxes of old pictures. Mine is a player mostly, and hers is a model, and we look at ourselves. After the photos, I stroll out beyond the garden. The brown, waving grass of the fields reminds me of Ella, my only wife of her long, soft hair, which made a tent over my face when we kissed. Toward mid-season, when I see Mr. Bartholomew again, he has been disposed as the chief executive at Energy. He's still very important, but lacks some of the old certainty. His mood is sort of reflective, and I decide to take this opportunity to talk about what's bothering me. We lunch in Houston Tower... There's a nice beef wellington, a good burgundy, and Daphne sits there like a stone, probably imagining she's in a movie. Well, knowledge, I see, says Mr. Bartholomew in reply to my topic that I brought up. What are you interested in, Johnny? History? Uh, the arts? Uh, can I be personal with you? Well, sure, naturally. He's a little uneasy, and although Mr. Bartholomew isn't especially one to inspire confession... I decide to blunder along. I began in the university. You know, that was, well, about 17 years ago. In those days, we still had books, and I read some, quite a few, because I thought I might make an executive. Jonathan, believe me, I, I can guess what you're going to say. <laughs> Mr. Bartholomew sighed and sipped some burgundy and glanced at Daphne. Well, I'm, uh, I'm one of the few with some real regrets about what happened to the books. Everything is still on tape. But it just isn't the same, is it? 
Nowadays, only the computer specialists read the tapes, and we're right back in the Middle Ages when only the monks could read the, the Latin script. Would you like me to assign you a specialist, Johnny? No, that's, that's not exactly it. Oh, you have some great film libraries. You could get a permit to see anything you want. The Renaissance, Greek philosophers. You know, I saw a nice summary film on the life and thought of Plato once. All I know is rollerball murder. You, you don't want out of the game, John. No, no, not at all. It's just that well, I want... God, Mr. Bartholomew, I don't know how to say it. I, I want more. He offered a blank look. But not things in the world. More for me, Mr. Bartholomew. He heaved a great sigh, leaned back, allowed the steward to refill his glass. I know that he understands. He's a man of about 60, enormously wealthy, powerful in our most powerful executive class. And behind his eyes is the deep, weary, undeniable comprehension of the life that he's lived. The knowledge, John, either converts to power or it converts to melancholy. Uh, which could you possibly want, Jonathan? You have power, you have status and skill, you have the whole masculine dream that many of us would like to have. And in rollerball murder, there's no room for melancholy, is there? In the game, the mind exists for the body to make a harmony of havoc, right? Do you want to change that? Do you want the, the mind to exist for itself alone? I don't think you actually want that, do you, John? I don't really know. Well, I'll, I'll get you some permits, Jonathan. You can see video films, learn something about reading tapes if you want. I don't think I really have any power. Oh, come on, John. Somehow the conversation drifts away from me. Daphne on cue, like the good spy for the corporation she probably is, starts feeding Mr. Bartholomew lines, and soon, oddly enough, we're discussing the upcoming game with Stockholm. A hollow space begins to grow inside me as though fire is eating out a hole. The conversation concerns the end of the season, the all-star game, records being set this year, but my disappointment in what exactly I don't even know begins to sicken me. Late season in the locker room, a pall takes us. We hardly speak among ourselves now, and like soldiers or gladiators sensing what lies ahead, we move around in the surgical odors, assuring ourselves we'll survive. Our last training and instruction this year concerns the delivery of death blows to opposing players. There's no time now for the tolerant shoving and bumping of yesteryear. I consider that I possess two good weapons. Because of my unusually good balance on skates, I can often shatter my opponent's knee with a kick. And also I have a fine backhand blow to the ribs and heart. So when I'm wheeling side by side with some opponent who raises an arm against me, that's it. If the new rules change, removes a player's helmet, of course, that's death. As it is right now, and there are rumors, rumors every day about what new version we'll have next of rollerball murder. But right now you go for the windpipe, the ribs, or the heart, the diaphragm, any place you don't break your hand. Now Daphne is gone, too. And in this interim, before another companion arrives, courtesy of all my friends and employers at Energy, Ella floats back into my dreams and daylight fantasies. I was a corporation child, some executive son I always preferred to think brought up in the Galveston section of the city. As a big kid, naturally athletic and strong. And this, according to my theory, gave me healthy mental genes too, because, well, I figure that strong in body is strong in mind. A man with brute speed surely also has the capacity to mull over his life. Anyway, I married the age of 15, while I worked on the docks for oil conglomerates. Ella was a secretary, slim, with long brown hair, and we managed to get permits both to marry and enter the university together. She was in general electronics, and I was in some pre-executive courses and rollerball murder. She fed me well that first year. I put on 30 hard pounds, and at night she soothed my bruises. Was she a spy, too? I've sometimes wondered whose job it was to groom the killer. And perhaps it was because she was my first woman ever, 18 years old, lovely, that I've never properly forgotten. She left me for an executive, just packed up, and went to Europe with him. Ella 
love one does consider, did you beef me up and break my heart in some great design of corporate society? Well, there I was, whatever, angry, hurt, beyond repair, I thought at the time. But the hand that stroked Ella soon dropped all the foes of Houston. I take sad stock of myself in this quiet period before another woman arrives. I'm smart enough, I know that. I had to be to survive, yet I, I seem to know nothing and can feel the hollow spaces in my own heart. Like one of those computer specialists, I have my know-how, I know what today means, what tomorrow likely holds, and maybe it's because the books are gone. Mr. Bartholomew is right, it's a shame they're transformed. Maybe it's because the books are gone that I, I feel so vacant. If I didn't remember my Ella, this I realize, I wouldn't even want to remember because it's love I'm recollecting. Recollect, sure. I read quite a few books that year with Ella, and afterward, too before turning professional in the game. Apart from all the volumes about how to get along in business, I read the history of the Kings of England, that Pillars of Wisdom book by T.E. Lawrence, all the forlorn novels, some Rousseau, a bio of Thomas Jefferson, and other odd bits. All on tapes now, all of that whirling away in a cool basement someplace. The rules crumble once more. At the Tokyo game, we discover there will be three oblong balls in play at all times. Some of our most experienced players are afraid to go out on the track now. And then after they're coaxed and threatened and finally consent to join, they fake injury whenever they can and sprawl in the infield. As for me, I play with greater abandon than ever and give the crowd its money's worth. The Tokyo skaters are either peering over their shoulders looking for approaching balls when I smash them or the poor devils are looking for me when a ball takes them out of action. One fellow with a broken back flaps around for a moment like a fish and then shudders and dies. The balls jump at us as though they have brains, but fate carries me as I know somehow it will. I'm a force field, a destroyer. I kick a biker into the path of a ball going at least 200 miles an hour. I swerve around a pileup of bikes and skaters, ride high on the track, zoom down, find a runner clubber who panics and misses with a roundhouse swing of his paddle. Without much ado, I belt him out of play with a certain knowledge. I felt it before, that he's dead before he hits the infield. A ball flips out of play soon after being fired from the cannon. It jumps the railing, sails high, and plows into the spectators. I take a hit from a ball. It's one of the three or four times I've ever been belted. The ball is riding low on the track when it catches me and strikes my calf and skate boot, so it's not too tough, although I tumble like a baby. While I'm down and hurting, I see one of our skaters, Moon Pie, killed. They take off his helmet, working slowly. It's like slow motion, and I'm writhing and cursing and unable to help. They open his mouth on the toe of a bastard's boot, and then they kick the back of his head and knock out his teeth that rattle downhill on the track. They kick again and stomp his brains this time. He drawls a last groaning goodbye while the cameras record it all. Later, I'm up pushing along once again, feeling bad, but knowing everyone else feels the same. I have that last surge of energy, the one I always get when I'm going good, and near the closing gun, I manage a nice move. Grabbing one of their runners with a headlock, I skate him off to limbo, bashing his face with my free fist, picking up speed until he drags behind like a dropped flag, and disposing of him in front of a ball which carries him off in a comic flop. Oh, God. God. Before the All-Star game, Cletus comes to me with the news I expect. This one will be a no-time-limit extravaganza in New York. Every multivision set in the world tuned in. The bikes will be more high-powered. Four oblong balls will be in place simultaneously. And the referees will blow the whistle on any sluggish player and remove his helmet as a penalty. Hmm, with those rules, no worry, I tell him. It'll go no more than in one hour and we'll all be dead. We're at the Houston Ranch on a Saturday afternoon, riding around in my electro cart, viewing my stock. Now, this is probably the ultimate spectacle of my wealth. My own beef cattle, and a day when only a few special members of the executive class have any meat at all to eat, with the exception of mass-produced fish. I tell Cleet that he owes me a favor. Anything, he answers, not looking me in the eyes. I turn the cart up a lane behind the rustic fence, an archway of oak trees overhead. I tell him, I want you to bring Ella to me. After all these years, yeah, that's what I want, Cleet. You arrange it and don't give me any excuses, okay? 
We meet at the villa near Lyon in early June, only a week before the New York All-Star game, and I think she immediately reads something in my eyes which helps her to love me again. Of course, I love her. I realize seeing her that I have only a vague recollection of being alive at all. And that was a long time ago in another century of the heart, when I had no identity except my name, when I was a simple dock worker before I ever saw all the world's places or moved in the rumbling nightmares of rollerball murder. And she kisses my fingers. Oh, she says softly, and her face is filled with true wonder. What's happened to you, Johnny? A few soft days. When our bodies aren't entwined, we try to remember and tell each other everything. The, the way we used to hold hands, how we fretted about receiving a marriage permit. How the books looked on our shelves in the old apartment in River Oaks. And we strain at times, trying to recall the impossible. It's true that history is really gone, that we have no families or touchstones, that our short personal lives alone judge us. And I want to hear about her husband, the places they've lived, the furniture in her house, anything. I tell her, in turn, about all the women, about Mr. Bartholomew, about Jim Cletus, about the ranch and the hills outside Houston. It would be nice, I think, once to imagine that she was taken away from me by some malevolent force in this awful age, but I know the truth of that. She went away simply because I wasn't enough back then, because those were the days before I yearned for anything. When I was beginning to live to play the game. But no matter. For a few days, she sits on my bed, and I touch her skin like a blind man. Our last morning together, she comes out in her traveling suit with her hair pulled up underneath a fur cap. The softness has left her voice, and she smiles with efficiency. She plays like a biker, I decide. She rides up there high above the turmoil, decides when to swoop down and makes a clean kill. Goodbye, Ella. I say, and she turns her head slightly away from my kiss so that I touch her fur cap with my lips. I'm glad I came, she says politely. Good luck, Johnny. New York is frenzied with what is about to happen. The crowds throng into energy plazas, warm the ticket offices at the stadium. And wherever I go, people are reaching for my hands, pushing my bodyguards away, trying to touch my sleeve as though I'm some ancient religious figure, a seer or prophet. Before the game begins, I stand with my team as the corporation hymns are played. I'm brute speed today, I tell myself, trying to rev myself up. Yet, a dream in my thoughts, I'm a bit unconvinced. A chorus of voices joins the band now as the music swells. The game. The game. All glory to it. The music rings. And I can feel my lips move with the words singing. Tonight we've done Roller Ball Murder by William Harrison. A story that first appeared in 1973 in Esquire magazine. It's reprinted in the book, the seventh annual best science fiction, 73. Edited by Harry Harrison and Brian Aldiss. This is Michael Hansen speaking. Production engineering for Mindwebs by Steve Gordon. Mindwebs is a production of WHA Radio in Madison, a service of University of Wisconsin Extension.